Hey everybody, uh, this is Mr. Ray, and we're going to take a look, a quick look, at the basic components of the Atkinson Schifrin model today. Um, Atkinson Schifrin model. Uh, and the Atkinson Schifrin model is uh, basically a model that describes the, the process of our memory system. It's a fairly simplistic model, but it does certainly uh, cover some, some complex uh, processes in it. We're going to extend it in another video. We're going to add on to one of those processes with some more recent research done by Badley and Hitch. Uh, but first, we're just going to kind of take a look at these three processes. And the three processes are sensory memory, um, short-term memory, and then, of course, down here, we're going to briefly talk about long-term memory. And we're going to revisit all those um, systems a little bit later on uh, when we talk about different types of long-term memory. So be patient. We'll get there. We're going to take a look at sensory memory first um, in the process. And if you kind of look at this um, atkinson Schiffer model, here, um, the sensory memory process really is uh, the beginning uh, of our memory system. And we have a lot of information coming in from our outside senses. And we're going to talk about our visual um, sensory memory for the most part. And visual information coming in from the outside world, um, those bits of visual information are called icons. And as visual information comes into our brain through our senses, um, there's really a couple of, of interesting things that happen. One of those things is this process that begins in the sensory memory is really a filtering process. And our brain has to filter out unnecessary information coming in to our system. And really, the, the thing that serves as a filter is, or at least one of the major filters, is what we pay attention to. And whatever we pay attention to tends to get across the memory system into the short-term memory. So if you see that little word attention there, if we pay attention, it's kind of like a spotlight on a dark night if you're camping up in the woods. Um, the only things you really notice are what's in that spotlight. And attention kind of serves as that spotlight, that if we're paying attention to something, information will get into short-term memory and we will be able to think about it. But anything that's not paid attention to really is forgotten, and we call that decay, um, or just stuff that's unnoticed, really. And the rule of thumb is unnoticed means that it is forgotten. And what things do we tend to notice? Well, we tend to notice things that are important to us, things that matter to us in the moment, whether we're looking for a person, we're looking for a file on the computer, uh, or we're looking for something in our backpack. Uh, nothing else seems to matter during that information. Um, information that is personal or meaningful to you somehow, we might notice things in a store, for example, in a grocery store for walking down the cereal aisle, um, you all know I have a, an issue with cereal. Um, I like it. But if I'm looking, looking for example, for Lucky Charms, um, I may be scanning that cereal aisle in the grocery store where there's hundreds of different types of cereal, uh, but I'm only going to be looking for that box um, with the four-leaf clover on it, and it says Lucky Charms on it, and I might not notice any of the boxes nearby. Um, and we also tend to remember things that are unusual or unexpected, information that could be dangerous to us, loud noises, a person who lunges towards us. Uh, if we're in the crowded cafeteria or the commons, we may see hundreds of people, but we forget them very quickly because they don't stand out. Of course, if somebody's running buck naked through that crowd, 
we may notice that person and remember them for a very long time. So our attention is drawn really to these things and other incidental information um, is going to be forgotten. Now, let's suppose that, uh, oh, I, I forgot something here. We gotta talk about duration. Um, iconic information is very fleeting, which means it only lasts for a very brief amount of time, maybe a 30th of a second. And we have to clear off our, our visual memory, kind of like your windshield wipers clearing off heavy rain. We gotta do it very quickly so we can pay attention to what's coming up. Um, we also have an echoic sensory memory um, that's for things that we hear, um, sound waves coming in to our ears, for example. But that lasts a little bit longer. That lasts maybe four seconds, hence the echo. Uh, and that kind of explains when we're maybe on Facebook, on the computer, and our parents say something to us, and we're like, yeah, 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 we hear you. And they say, you're not even listening to me. And you're like, what? I am too. And your parents uh, give you that, well, what did I say? And you're like, uh-oh, you're in trouble. And you're like, oh, I don't know. But if you wait a couple seconds, uh, maybe that comes back to you. And you're like, yes, I did hear you. Uh, and you can repeat what they said. Yeah, I, I know. I'm supposed to come down for dinner now. So... Um, if you, you wait a few seconds, sometimes that memory sticks and you can find it. Now, if information does, you do pay attention to it, and it does get into that short-term memory system uh, right here in the middle of our model, at least, uh, that information then can be thought about. And really what happens in that system, what we're, we're, we're pretty familiar with, is the duration of our short-term memory and the capacity of our short-term memory. A couple things you always want to think about in every section. How long does it last? And Peterson and Peterson did the famous study in the 1950s and they flashed consonants on the screen, something like um, TQB, and then they had their subject um, count backwards from a number by threes. So they might say, okay, 167. And then they had to say, of course, 163, 160, 157. And what they were doing was trying to distract the subject so they couldn't rehearse those consonants. And then after three to 12 seconds, maybe even 20 seconds, they said, what were those letters? And the longer somebody waited, the longer somebody counted backwards, the less likely they were to remember what those letters were. And that's where we get that maybe 20 to 30 seconds our short-term memory can last without rehearsal. So if we go back up to our short-term memory system, this little loop that we have right here kind of represents rehearsal. If we rehearse information for any length of time, we're more likely to keep it in that short-term memory. But if we can't rehearse and we are distracted, um, then we probably will lose something within 20 to 30 seconds, okay? Now, what about capacity? Um, well, capacity, that's probably the most famous number in memory. How many things can it hold? And Miller did that study in the mid-1950s with capacity and found the very famous number that we all know as 7 plus or minus 2. Um, I think maybe I usually show my students uh, the number like this, 7 plus or minus 2. Um, and we've all done that in psych class. We've seen numbers on the screen anywhere from... 1 um, to um, 9 or 10 numbers, and then we're asked to recall those numbers, and the more numbers that we saw in the original list, the less likely we are to be able to remember those. So we usually get somewhere between 5 and 9 numbers. 
that, of course, is our short-term memory system. And one th interesting thing to note that we're better at remembering random strings of numbers rather than letters. Um, why? Well, because this is easier to group or chunk than four random strings of letters uh, for most people. So um, numbers we can think of times or distances or other factors, whereas we don't have a lot of use for random sequences of letters. Now, if information is thought about uh, enough, maybe it's elaborated on, it's important, somehow that information can get into the long-term memory system. It can get encoded into the system through various methods that we spoke about with encoding. We can semantically encode. We can rehearse. We can space out our studying. Information can get into this long-term memory system, which could be or could last forever. It could be permanent storehouse. There's some studies that show uh, that information might decay without use, use it or lose it, Ebbinghaus theory, the forgetting curve. But um, we will talk about some of the systems involved in long-term memory a little bit later um, and the brain parts associated with implicit and explicit long-term memory. But for now, we were just kind of introducing the uh, atkinson Schiffer model, and we're going to stop there. So hopefully this kind of helps you out. Remember those three stages. Uh, remember the three stages are the sensory memory system, short-term memory system if we pay attention, and then if we rehearse or encode information, may actually get into the long-term system. And there is, of course, um, evidence that shows information can get from the sensory memory automatically into the long-term memory because we talked about automatic processing. Things like information about space, time, and frequency can also get in there. And once it's in the long-term memory, we might be able to retrieve it back into our conscious awareness. All right, so that's it. Thanks for watching. Um, our next video will deal with the working memory system.